Hello everyone and welcome back to Strike Zone with manager George Samus. Strike Zone is a weekly program that gives you, the fans, the opportunity to ask the St. Paul Saints skipper questions about the Saints, the American Association, baseball and sports in general, or if you have questions about life and would like to hear George's opinion or words of wisdom about that, you're welcome to pose those questions as well. And this week we actually have a couple of questions like that. My name is Rob Panier, and I'm the managing editor of the Minor League Sports Report. This week, we join George at his office at the CHS Field here in St. Paul, where the Saints are about to take the field against the Sioux Falls Canaries, riding a 10-game winning streak. The Saints have been incredibly hot lately and have opened the season with a franchise record 14-1 record. So this is an exciting time to be posing some questions to the skipper. If you'd like to submit your own questions to George, all you need to do is send us an email at askgeorge at minorleaguesportsupport.com. That's askgeorge at minorleaguesportsupport.com. Please have your questions in by Friday at noon so that we can hand them to the Saints skipper Friday evening. We like to give George a couple of days to review the questions before we pose them to him on Sunday. We want to thank George for joining us here again this week, and let's get to our program. Okay, so thanks again, George, for joining us this week. So let us begin with uh, Tom from Maple Grove asks, uh, wants to know if you've ever been as a player or manager that had a hot streak like this before. Tell you, the, one year in New Jersey, um, one of the years we won the championship there, we had won the first half, that's back when it was halves, and we started out the second half 0-2 in a series in Quebec, and then we ended up going 19-1 and the next 20 games. So. To me, that was the best streak that I've ever been a part of, going 19 and one. Wow, that must have been quite a streak. It was, sure. uh, it was amazing, yes. Okay, Michael from St. Paul wants to know. Uh, he, he watched you guys play at home a couple of weekends ago, and he watched you shift your infield. So you had three guys on the right side. He wanted to know what criteria you looked at to try to do stuff like that. You know what? Sometimes, if if a hitter is a dead pull hitter and you know it, left-handed, right-handed, whatever it is, sometimes you just take some chances and. You, know, you see in the big leagues too a lot, and those lefties come up, they shift a lot. So it's just a hunch you have, and you just hope you're right, and sometimes you are, and and sometimes you give credit to the hitter, they go the other way and find the hole. You know, I'm curious when you watch that in major league games, why a guy, okay, I understand like a Dave Ortiz, but why a guy doesn't just bunt? Maybe those guys don't want to bunt, you know? Maybe those big power hitters, they're there to hit doubles, hit home runs, and they have no interest in bunting, so, um, and maybe those power hitters, David Ortiz, that hit 30, 40 home runs, if they want to lay a bunt down, go ahead and lay one down. Interesting. Uh, let's see, Al from St. Paul wants to know what you attribute Angelo Sanko's quick start to. He's just swinging the bat well, and he's he's going with pitches. He's hit balls the other way. He's They pitch him in, he's, he's hit a couple home runs, and he's just, um, he's off to a good start, and... Um, and I'm happy for him because he's he was one of our better players last year, and he's one of the better guys on the team, and a good clubhouse guy, and um, it just he's confident up there and swinging the bat well. Sammy from Minneapolis wants to know. Uh, he explains that Jeff Shields and Robert Code didn't seem to have that good a season last year for the team, and what he thought you thought were the differences for them this season. You know, that's a good question. Um, I had Code for a couple of years, and the first year we had him, he was outstanding. He won 12 games, and last year. I think last year, I don't know if he was fully healthy, and um, you know he got behind in the count a lot and got some pitches up, and they hit him. But this year, um, I mean, both of them, maybe they're throwing more strikes and being around the plate more and, and getting ahead. Um, again, when you get behind in the count, it's it could be an issue if you keep doing it too much. Robert Cole is hurt right now. Uh, what is, what's the injury with him? At the he is, does not have an injury. It was more of a roster spot decision. So he is healthy, and he's pitching tomorrow. Okay. And in... The independent leagues or in this league, having a guy in the DL, even if he's not hurt, a phantom DL, um, it's not uncommon. It happens, and it happens in double AA, A, triple A. I see it all the time, guys going on the phantom DL. So there's no injury at all, um, just more of just having a roster spot. So it's kind of like an inactive list more than a DL. Seven day DL. It's a seven day thing, and yeah. you know, we wanted to activate Mitch Elliott to get him a couple of bats because he hadn't had any at bats. And, we happened to have an off day a few days ago, so with the luxury of having the off day, we just decided to put Co on the DL. If we wouldn't have that off day a few days ago, he would not have gone on the DL. It was just more of just for a roster spot. 
Uh, Hal from Bloomington wants to know that last season the team seemed to struggle late but was still in the pennant race. I'm assuming he's asking what what's a decision that you make where you say, okay, it's time to move on towards next season. Well, we were um, we were right in there the first three months of the season. The last month we just collapsed and it was a terrible collapse and there was, what, 10 days left in the season. We made a couple of changes and you don't ever want to be in that position, but, you know, sometimes you are and, um, you know, we traded away one of our best hitters, um, Henry Wrigley, last year at the trade deadline. And Dustin Crenshaw was one of the players we got back and it ended up working out. And again, you don't want to be in that position where you're just about out of it, where you start trading guys. But if you are, I don't see why you wouldn't to try to get some good guys for the next season. Actually, I think Alonzo Harris came in yes. the field as well. Yes, yes, that was the case as well. And they needed a pitcher at the, um, at the deadline and that's what ended up happening. We talked about a couple of players. There was another pitcher that we were talking about as well from New Jersey, but it just worked out with Alonso. I know Vinny DeFazio came. It was actually in a trade, but came at the end of the season as well. Yeah, he was, Grand Prairie released him. They had released him, so he was a free agent, and we needed a catcher, and it just worked out. He's having quite the year so far. He's off to a good start, and he's a good kid, and, and we're glad he's with us. Uh, Beth from Hudson would like to know, what is the highlight of your career as a player and as a manager? You know what? Nothing will ever top the day they tell you you're going to the big leagues. That's the highlight of my career. Um, I know I had the one year in the big leagues, and you know it wasn't it wasn't the best career. As like I hit around pretty good, but the day they tell you you're going to the big leagues is is the greatest thing. Patrick from Crystal would like to know if you're interested in managing the Twins one day. I love being here. I'm happy being here with the Saints, and I want to be here as long as they'll have me. Yeah, I'm kind of curious in talking with the other independent league managers that you guys talk about that at affiliate ball, uh, the the manager really has very little say in what goes on. That that's kind of chosen by the organization. Is that true even at the major league level at all? Do, are some decisions the manager's making? I believe in the minors. This is what I'm told. I'm, I've heard in the minor leagues the manager doesn't make up the lineup. The organization does. Um, in the big leagues, though, I think in the big leagues the manager he decides all the moves, what goes on during the games, who plays. And that's the way it should be. But I guess in the minors and player development, I guess, you know, those top round draft picks, they're playing, even if they're struggling, they're in there. And um, But once the game goes, then you manage the game. But I don't think they, I don't think they make out the lineup every day. Miguel from Minneapolis wants to know what made you decide that your own playing career was over. I had two shoulder surgeries. And even before I got hurt, I was an 82, 83 mile per hour guy. I never threw hard in the first place. And then I had two shoulder surgeries, and after that, it was I couldn't even get it up to 80 miles per hour anymore. So when that happens, it's probably time to shut it down and do something else. You know, I'm wondering when you when you got called up, how was it when your experience when you first walked out to the the Metrodome field there? You know, when I got called up, my first when I got called up, it was we went to Milwaukee first, and you're in the big leagues. It's it was great. It was in the older stadium too, and it's just great to be there. You just can't believe you're in the big leagues, and then. I think it was then with the Tiger Stadium next, and that was beautiful as well with the history. And then we came back to the Metrodome, and I love the Metrodome. I thought it was great, and it was uh, with the baseball, the football, and just all the history there. And it's a tough place to pitch, but just to see that Metrodome, and I liked it. No rain delays, not too hot in there, not too cold in there, and it was just a great place to be, and I was lucky to get the chance to do it. Very nice. Uh, okay, we have a couple of questions about people wanting to know about baseball in general. So Steve from Burnsville wants to know, he has a son playing Little League, and he uh, who's a pitcher, and wants to know if you have tips to protect his son's arm. I wouldn't throw any curveballs at that age. Just throw fastballs and change-ups and play catch. And you know what? Something that I was told when I was little, play a lot of long toss. That's how you get your arm stronger. Do that. Play catch, long toss. and uh, But stay away from the curveball. You don't need to throw curveballs and. 11, 12 years old. For what reason? So you can get some some kids out when you're 11, 12 years old. If you want to have a career and pitch in high school and college and maybe professional one day, lay off the curveballs, just throw fastballs and change-ups and get that arm stronger by throwing a lot of long toss. What would you say is an appropriate age to start looking at using a curveball? Um, maybe in high school. I would say in high school. Maybe that's the time to do it. But before that, I advise against it. 
Jim from Bloomington wants to know if you offer camps to help uh, people improve their basement. Yes, we do have camps. We have three camps throughout the summer here. Um, I believe there's a couple in July and one in August. I don't have the dates right here in front of me, but we've been doing camps for the Saints every year since I've been here. And, um, and now, with the new stadium, I really suggest that you want to come to the camps. You'll have a blast. You'll learn something. And obviously, you're ha having a camp here in the nicest stadium that, in this country. I would assume those camp dates are on the website. Saints yeah, they are out there, and I should know them. I just don't have them right here in front of me. Um, like I said, I believe there's a couple in, in July, and I believe there's one in August. If you want to know saintsbaseball.com, you can yep. find out where those dates are at. Uh, so, okay, so we have, let's uh, we'll see, Marco from Duluth wants to know, he watches a lot of Rochester Red Wings uh, AAA baseball and is interested to know when he watches players that come out after 60 or 80 pitches all the time. And wants to know if you see that younger guys should have pitch counts like that. You know, maybe in April, in the first month of the season, maybe it's it's wise to do that. To, you don't want guys throwing 100 pitches right off the bat. But as the season goes on, you know, third, fourth month, and they've been thrown for a few months, I don't see it being a big deal getting 100 pitches. But just you just don't want to just start at 100 pitches. You want to just you know work your pitch count up to it. When you were in the minors, were there pitch counts on you as well? I believe so. I don't remember what they were, but... There's not too many games you're throwing 120, 130 pitches. I, I don't really remember that even happening. So it's just um, you want to protect yourself too. But, you know, if you're pitching seven, eight innings, like Dustin Crenshaw last night where he had 80 pitches or whatever it was, you sent him back out for the ninth inning. And he did a great job. And I think he ended up with 90 pitches or 88 pitches. So, yes. you know, as the season goes on, and it's, it's how – how he feels, or if they're getting good swings off him, and maybe time to get him out of there. But if he's dealing and he's up there around 100 pitches, maybe you send him back out for that ninth inning. Uh, Bill from Blaine would like to know what you think about the New York Mets moving to a six-man rotation for the season. You know, I don't. Um, I I kind of like the five-man rotation. Pitch pitch every fifth day. To me, that's that's my opinion. Um, what they're doing that. It doesn't mean I'm right, in my opinion. That's just what they feel like they're, they're doing, and maybe that's the right way as well. But I like having five five good starters out there and pitching every fifth day. Jim would like to know, he had watched on ESPN and saw some of their commentators discussing that there would probably never be another 300-game winner. Would you agree with that? You know, I don't know. Um, it would be tough. I don't remember who the last one was. I know there have been some good pitchers, um, some great pitchers. The Pedro Martinez, the Randy Johnsons, the Greg Maddox, those have been some great pitchers we've seen. Um, but the 300 game winners, I don't even know who's close or who's reached it. Um, but Clayton Kershaw, he's going to be a guy that's going to be a pretty good one for a long time. And, um, and Bumgarner, he's, he's pretty good, that guy, huh? He's, he's a clutch pitcher too, and he can, you saw what he did in the World Series last year. It's just, it's good to have quality guys like that, but. Over 300 wins, I really wouldn't, I couldn't really give you a, a fair assessment. It seems like they are pulling guys so early now yeah. that it, it just doesn't really give a guy a chance to get a lot more wins. Like, you know, a Nolan Ryan would pitch eight, nine innings almost every game. Absolutely. See, that's the thing, okay, and that's back to the pitch count question. Well, Nolan Ryan threw all those pitches and he was great, you know, so why is it right now to have guys on pitch counts? Well, back then he would throw all the time. So who's really right? Is it right to? Throw 120 pitches, or is it right to cut them off at 100? Who knows? Yeah, I, I'm curious because your career when it began, I, I grew up as an Oakland A's fan, and when Billy Martin was there, yeah. people criticized the way he ran, if you want to call this, uh, like uh, Mike Norris and Steve McCaddy. Yeah, I think yeah. they had, he had like 25 complete games in 1980. Is Do you think that had an effect? It's things like that that have all of a sudden caused managers to go, whoa, we gotta we got to start watching this kind of thing. See, I honestly don't know what the right answer for that is. If it's guys throwing too much or guys not throwing enough, I don't know what the right answer is because back in those days, they threw a lot more. So maybe they were stronger because they threw more. Who knows? It's just people have their opinions. The one thing, I, I don't think it's right to throw 130, 140 pitches. That's probably shouldn't happen, you know, if it's now or 30 years ago. But who knows what the right way is. And But if the guy's throwing well and he's run 100 pitches and he's still throwing the ball well, I'm going to send him back out. Excellent. 
Uh, let's see, Brad from Richfield wants to know what your thoughts are on rule changes in baseball, including block, no longer block, being able to block the plate, instant replay, and limiting time between pitches. I was always a fan of the instant replay, but last year the way they did it when the manager would step out of the dugout and, or, or even go out to the umpire and they'd be looking back at the dugout, I didn't like that at all. I thought that was, I thought that was bad for the game. Now I guess they're, it's a little bit quicker. Um, but you want the umpires to get the call right. It's a tough job. I know everybody wants to yell at the umpires, you know, including all the managers. And um, it's a tough job. And but I'm a fan of the instant replay, you know, more the way they have it now. But not last year, where he would the umpire would go out there and be talking to the umpire, looking back in the dugout, waiting for the thumbs up or thumbs down. As far as blocking the plate, I think it's good because you don't want um, you don't want guys getting run over. Um, and I know some guys would be against that because running over the catcher is part of the game. So um, I, I like what they have done with it now and because you don't want guys getting hurt. Does that same rule apply in the in, the in this league, you can plow the catcher. You can't run them over because obviously the games are on TV. And it's just, it's a little bit tougher to, it's a little bit tougher where catchers stand. In. But here you are allowed to run the catcher over. Okay. I'm curious if you were commissioner for the day, what's a rule change you'd want to see different? Um, you know what? They should not allow pitching coaches to go out to the mound and talk to the pitcher. It slows the game down. So that's that's a minor one for me. It's just and the and the open move to second. You, you know how they outlaw the fake to third, throw to first move. Well, you know what? Outlaw the open move to second because that's that's deceiving too. So that's one I would get rid of for sure. So would you then allow just the first time the manager comes out to the pitcher, he's done? Yeah, it's. I, mean, I know there's certain situations, and even I go out there in certain situations where maybe uh, you got to talk to them and make sure they know which bunt player we're in or first and third. Um, and if you can't really eliminate it, maybe just a pitching coach should only be allowed to go out a couple game, a couple times a game. But when they go out there five, six times, to me that slows the game down. Uh, it's, it's. I would dump that one. Okay, that's interesting. Tim from Cottage Grove would like to know what you would do with a player like Yasiel Puig, who is an incredible talent, but does some kind of bonehead plays at some times. Yeah, special talent. And he's young, though, too, and he's, he has some tools. And, and I know people want to criticize him. And, and again, I don't see too many big league games, but there's times I've seen him at a base hit up the middle and get a double out of it because he was hustling. And you like the way he hustles, and you want guys to hustle. Um, but. Um, He's young, and I know he's made some mistakes, and hopefully he learns from them. And but you do want guys that hustle like that, because again, a routine ground ball up the middle where the guy gets a double out of it—that means he did something right. Stevie from Stillwater wants to know who you believe is going to the World Series this year. You know what? Um, Twins are in first place. Let's hope they. I'm pulling for them, so let's hope they can um, keep it going. And you never know what's going to happen in this game, because last year I don't think anybody thought the Royals were going to the World Series. Um, you know what? I'm, I'm pulling for the Twins, and I hope they can just keep it going. Excellent. All right, do you have a prediction on the NBA Finals for this season? Uh, I grew up in San Jose, California, so I'm going to root for the Warriors. And um, that first game, I really don't even watch basketball, but I watched the first game the other night, and that was, what an excellent game, outstanding game to watch, exciting, and back and forth. And but I'm pulling for the Warriors. Uh, we had a couple of open questions for people to ask, just about life kind of situations. So. Uh, we have a, a person who identifies himself as guy who needs answers. Uh, wants to know if his girlfriend has a cat and would like him to move in with her, but he doesn't really like cats and he's afraid that if he asks her to get rid of the cat and, a, and an ultimatum, he may not be the one she chooses. So, if you like your girlfriend, I would say go in and move in with the cat. Cats are harmless; they don't bother you. Um, they don't bark like dogs. You don't have to take them out to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night. So. Kids are easy. If you don't like your girlfriend, then okay, do it. But if you like your girlfriend, then make a sacrifice and just go with it. And Emily from St. Paul wants to know if you're married and if she can have your phone number if you're not. Yes, I am, but thank you very much. And that's the first time I've been asked that. So that was very nice, and thank you anyways. Excellent. Thank you this week, George, and we'll see you next week. Okay, thank you very much. We'd like to thank George Samus for joining us here this week on Strike Zone. If you have questions you'd like to pose to the St. Saint Paul Saints manager, please send them to askgeorge at minorleaguesportsreport.com. That's askgeorge at minorleaguesportsreport.com.
Just as a note, George had mentioned during the interview that there is a camp that is going on this summer here. If you'd like more information, you can see that at saintsbaseball.com. The dates themselves are July 7th through 9th is the first camp. The second camp is July 20th, 21st, and 23rd. And the third camp is August 5th through the 7th. Once again, if you would like more information on that, please visit saintsbaseball.com. I'm Rob Panier from the Minor League Sports Report, and I'd like to thank you for joining us here on Strike Zone this week, and we look forward to seeing you again next week.